congressman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that which kind of brings me to the point. Uh, several years ago, my pastor at Chatham, I finished there a year and a half ago, um, we, we did a study on a book written by James McDonald. <laughs> The title was Lord Change My Attitude. <laughs> if any of you know James McDonald, uh, and he's fallen from grace, uh, <clears throat> sort of. Uh, but I, I was impressed with that study. And uh, I said, you know, I need to hear, and our congregation needs to hear more on this subject. And uh, so I, I thought, boy, I used this as a message. A matter of fact, at Passfield a few weeks ago, and I thought, well, this is appropriate for men to hear. Um, a critical spirit seems to permeate every aspect of our society anymore. Uh, not just politics, although politics is a big thing. You know, I can remember when Democrats and Republicans came together and worked together on things. Uh, but on the political scene, we hardly hear anymore uh, what a candidate plans to do when they be elect, when they're going to be elected or want to be elected, what we hear instead is opposing candidates uh, ripping them apart, and vice versa. Uh, what's bad about that person? What and try to dig up all the dirt on them? Uh, and I've watched my brother deal with this, who is a tremendous Christian man. Um, in the entertainment and political scene, the media and the public seem to be much more interested in the dirt that they can find on celebrities than the true qualities that they exhibit. Uh, it's at the point, I don't, in, I don't in any way desire, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> some of the uh, visibility that my brother has. Because, uh, you know, you, you're just, you're a target. You're a target. You know, we watched this with uh, uh, President Trump, and now we've got President Biden and it's starting on President Biden, too, even though they haven't quit on President Trump. And uh, it's just a spirit, a critical spirit that, that we, we face on Facebook, on Twitter, on web chat, on other social networks. You can type the most innocent statements uh, or post some of the most innocent posts, a simply a point of view, and you'll be verbally attacked. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed at this. Um, we live in a society where common courtesy is a rarity and rudeness has become the norm. Uh, road rage, my goodness. Uh, people seem to be looking for a fight, for a point of disagreement, for a flaw in somebody else or in some organization. Uh, let me just give you a little background here. The adjective critical is in the English language a word that has a number of different meanings. Among them, the word means vital, uh, verging on an emergency, tending to point out errors, and it means careful. If you're, in an, if you're an emergency room doctor with a patient in critical condition, that means they're on the highest alert. Uh, it's absolutely critical, in other words, vital or essential, that you be critical, careful, and judicious in your approach to their care so that at the critical, decisive moment, you can save their life. You must also be critical, that is, you must point out all errors and flaws of the jobs that your colleagues are doing. So the word has all kinds of meanings, but in this context, a critical perspective is something that is not only helpful, but it's necessary. It's a perspective that comes from having knowledge, from having skill, from having discernment. It's a gift. But what's a critical spirit? A critical spirit is a compulsive attitude of fault finding, which seeks to tear down others rather than to build others up. And in that context, criticism is an act of criticizing to judge as a critic, to find fault, to blame, or to condemn. A critical spirit is different from a critical perspective. A critical spirit is destructive. A critical perspective offers constructive feedback. The only criticism that is ever constructive is a criticism that speaks the truth in love to build up, to encourage another person for his or her good 
and in our perspective for God's glory. A critical spirit, on the other hand, is a curse, both for the person possessing it and for those that it criticizes. In Romans, the 14th chapter, by the way, Romans is my favorite book of the Bible, and Romans 8, my favorite chapter, but Romans 14, verses 10 through 13. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I won't stand before you this morning and uh, portray to you that I'm innocent in this problem. <laughs> uh, over the years, I have finally honed my critical skills. <laughs> Uh, I can write a critical letter where it's worth framing. Uh, I've been called a wordsmith with my conversations that I write out, and with my wordsmithiness, I can use words to cut like a knife. Several years ago, I prayed before the house. It was an event that uh, some people knew about around the world. It was called the impeachment of Governor Blagojevich, and I opened the house with prayer when that was done. And I had a person criticize me for the prayer that I did because I didn't do it the way this person thought I ought to do it. And she sent me a letter. And uh, so I wrote something back in response. And, you know, our helpmates help us in these kinds of things. And I read it to my wife. And she said, Milton, that is an excellent letter of response to that woman. She said, now wad it up and throw it away. <laughs> 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 because it was about winning. I wasn't going to instruct this woman. She had her point of view. She stated her point of view. And while it was rather firm, it wasn't ugly. I was reacting to her criticism of me. And so over the years, I have just begun to learn that, that sometimes it's better to remain silent. Yeah. Um, the sad thing is, I can take what God has given to me as a gift, and I can misuse it so it becomes a curse. James chapter 3, uh, verses 2 through 10. You know this verse, but let me just read it in this context. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able to also bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. <clears throat> Look also at ships. Although they're, so, although they're so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Well, even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Shannon McCoy is a counselor with the Biblical Counseling Coalition, and she posed these questions I want to read to you in regard to assessing if you have a critical spirit. She said, do you criticize and pass judgment on others? Do you find yourself with a negative disposition, always finding fault with something or someone? Is it difficult? for you to see the positive in a person or in a situation because the negative is so glaring in your eye? Are you compelled to give your critical point of view for the good of all mankind? <laughs> if you answered yes to one of these questions, then you have a critical spirit <clears throat> and you're in danger. Not getting hit by a truck kind of danger, but an even more serious kind, and that is a spiritual danger. A critical spirit is from the dark side it is meant to hurt and destroy its subject. 
A critical spirit is a negative attitude of our heart that seeks to condemn, it seeks to compete and therefore tear down and destroy with words. And in contrast, constructive criticism involves opinions, but they are opinions that are intended to build up. A critical spirit creates blind spots in our hearts, and it creates blind spots in our minds causing us to believe that we're being constructive, when in reality, it's ungodly. It's ungodly. Our tendency is to judge others by their actions and to judge ourselves by our intentions, right? Uh, I've encountered that spirit in various ways. For instance, I know a person, a family member, who truthfully believes that she is concerned and instructive when she criticizes someone else, which she does frequently. However, whenever someone criticizes or corrects her, they are mean, they are rude, and they are judgmental. Uh, the fact is that we can't perfectly judge anybody else. Not perfect. We don't have a heart x-ray machine. That is to say, we don't know the motivations of a person's heart. And since all of us are sinful, and we of all people ought to know that, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then we ought to be able to understand that all of us will be flawed even in our opinions and certainly in our behaviors from time to time. We are, all of us, so to speak, in the same boat. We ought to be content to be more focused on judging ourselves and seeking to bring our own lives into alignment with the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 11.31 For if we would judge ourselves, we would be not judged. Here's my thoughts I want to give you this morning, and I'll keep conscious of the time because this fasting thing doesn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, my stomach, once it gets to growling, it might overcompensate for my voice. So, uh, first of all, being critical can be a gift depending upon one's heart. Being critical can be a gift depending upon one's heart. John Ankerberg, evangelist, television personality, author, apologist, theologian, he describes some characteristics of constructive critical perspective. Let me give them to you. Number one, it's a descriptive rather than evaluative. In other words, it is describing rather than posing an, a judgment of value, reducing the need for others to react defensively. Uh, constructive critical perspective is specific rather than General, You know how that works, don't you? When you get in an argument with perhaps your spouse, you know, that might happen. And you say, you're always. <laughs> no, they're not. Not always. But, boy, that's a good word to use when you really want to have a forceful argument. Uh, be specific rather than general. As a rule, the more specific we are, the more helpful we are. It's directed toward behavior that the receiver can control or do something about. It's well-timed. Boy, that's a good one. Trust needs to be established, but generally, the sooner the better. <coughs> it is solicited rather than imposed. Feedback is most appreciated when it's requested. It is checked with the receiver in order to ensure clear, factual, or accurate communication. Boy, you know how many times I have been a part of this myself and how many times I have counseled this. that it, It's not about winning. It's not about winning. And if it is, then you've got an issue that you need to take care of. We live in such a competitive world, and among us men, com competition is such a big deal. We have to win. We have to win. I'm not sure that comes from heaven. You know, we have to do our best for the Lord, but uh, winning, I'm not sure that's a heavenly attribute. Right? Yeah. It takes into account the needs of the giver and the receiver of the feedback. In other words, truth is spoken in love. 
And then number eight, it is always expressed face to face, never as gossip behind another's back. And, and emails, you know, <laughs> they're so quick, but boy, you know, they're not talking face to face. And so once you send a letter, once you send an email, then you have to explain what you really were saying. This kind of spirit, it, it, it's a gift. It, it's, it's constructive. We're instructed by the Lord to hold one another accountable to build up and mature the body of Christ. A critical perspective is required for that kind of task. But that perspective isn't focused upon finding fault with somebody. Its, it's focus is redemptive. Its focus is for building up. Its focus is to better not only the person uh, that needs correction, but the body of Christ as a whole. Matthew 18, 15 through 17, words of our Lord. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, we'll take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, well then let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And that doesn't mean take him out to the edge of town and stone him. <laughs> it means to continue to pray for them, to continue to, to fellowship in the respect of, you know, cordiality or whatever. But uh, no, there, there needs to be some accountability held here and to seek to bring them back into an understanding that blesses the body and blesses the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak. Boy, this is a tough one. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. I was a church planter when I first came to this area. I'm from Murfreesboro, Illinois, down by Carbondale. And uh, I came to Greenview Baptist Chapel after I left seminary from New Orleans in 1980. And from 1980 to 81, that was Greenview Baptist Chapel. And while I was a church planter, I received financial support from Illinois Baptist State Association and the Home Mission Board, which is now the North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. Harold Cameron, uh, IBSA Missions Director, was my direct supervisor for Illinois Baptist Association and the Home Mission Board. And uh, Harold had had many years of successful experience in starting new churches. I mean, hundreds of churches. Uh, Harold was a person who had a very critical eye and a very critical mind for Christian mission work. And I have to tell you, he held my nose to the grindstone. I was 26 years old when I went there. I'm now 67, um, going on 68. He assessed monthly reports that I had to turn in. He held, uh, held me accountable, and he pointed out areas where I was weak. He advised me on how to strengthen those weaknesses, uh, gave me counsel in problems that I dealt with, and told me how I could handle some of those problems better, like not writing letters. <laughs> uh, he could be pretty tough, but boy, I love that man. He, he was, um, along with Delbert Penrod, one of my greatest encouragers in ministry, and I learned a lot from him. And his critical perspective helped me to build up and encourage, be, help, be built up and encourage me in my ministry. In 1981, Greenview Baptist Chapel became First Baptist Church of Greenview. Uh, but Harold, I, he had a heart for the Lord and he had a heart for the young pastors that he was in charge of. His heart was right. His critical perspective was a gift. But secondly, being critical can be a curse, depending upon one's heart. Um, Shannon McCoy categorizes this problem in four types of critical spirits. Uh, you've heard these terms before. Number one is a gossiper. A gossiper is a person who reveals secrets. 
going about as a tale bearer or a scandal monger. He or she has privileged information about people and proceeds to reveal that information to others with the sinful motive of trying to better themselves and put the other person down without knowledge or approval of that person. That person can't defend themselves. Gossipers attempt to make... Uh, well, they, they seek to build themselves up. They seek to make themselves significant to the person that's listening by appearing to have this uh, ability to know things that nobody else seems to know. Then there's the slanderer. The slanderer is a person who makes false statements in order to damage a person's reputation. He or she doesn't care about the truth. They don't care about correcting an error. A slanderer creates error in order to inflict harm. And boy, we could... When we talk about the media today, yeah. it seems like that's become the norm. Proverbs 16.28 says, A perverse man spreads strife, and a slanderer separates intimate friends. 1 Peter 2.1, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Now there's the judgmentalist. A judgmental person has an excessively critical point of view characterized by a tendency to judge harshly. He or she lacks empathy for others, uh, for their viewpoints, because they believe that their point of view is always the right one. He or she believes that he or she has the ability to know the motives of others. He or she has the amazing skill to point out others' mistakes while minimizing their own. And then there's the complainer. A complainer is a person who is habitually negative about others and about circumstances in life. They're characterized by discontentment and ingratitude. Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Mark DeJesus of uh, Charisma Magazine, and did I pronounce that right? Is it DeJesus? It's DeJesus, that's the way it's spelled, but if you've heard of him. He's given some signs to indicate a person is operating with a critical spirit. In general, they have a negative lens on life. They might deny it in themselves, but everybody else can see it. Uh, they move to the negative side very easily. And then they have a hard time focusing on loving relationships without always addressing the negative about something or someone. And then when they talk about a person or a situation, they focus on the negative uh, instead of helpful solutions. And then their focus is always on flaws. They complain a lot. They don't know how to live without complaining about something. They always upset, they're always upset about something. And regarding people who are succeeding or doing well, the critical spirit shows up to find something wrong with them to focus on. They spend most of their communication focusing on what they're against, but very little time highlighting the good that they're for. And they're very rarely pleased. Now, I don't know about you, but over the years I've encountered those kinds of people. Uh, but over the last couple of decades, it seems that this critical spirit seems to be growing into more of an epidemic. It yes. uh, seems that some of the main factors that cause this, in an individual anyway, are some of the same factors that are causing it in a society. I think one of them is insecurity. Uh, quite often, criticism flows from people who are not very secure in how they see themselves. We often see others through how we see ourselves. Therefore, we project that toxicity onto others that we actually are carrying within our own being. Our society is horribly insecure. And then there's self-accusation. Criticism is fueled by an accusing spirit, especially in the words that we speak. Being critical of others helps us to avoid dealing with ourselves keeping us from confronting the issues that we have in our own heart. In our society, accountability nowadays is deemed to be unfair 
and always someone else is to blame for our problems. I just dealt with this the other day in a situation and I, I felt the need to say to the person, you know, when you look at what you've just told me here, nobody else is to blame for the decisions that you've made. You, you've made your own decisions. And uh, my hope is that they came to realize, but it's gonna take some time because it's a mindset that they've developed. It's easier to blame than it is to be accountable. And then there's bitterness, oh my. Criticism gains momentum in people that have unresolved bitterness and unforgiveness and unforgiving issues in their life. They've got unhealed disappointments that seep into their perspective and those cancerous values are, they're not only encouraged, but they're celebrated. Vengeance and quick justice are preferable to forgiveness and grace anymore. Comparison and competition. And I talked a little bit about this earlier. When we are insecure about who we are and where we are, criticizing others is a, an easy manifestation. We often criticize those who threaten our insecurity and our lack of growth. And so we seek to beat them. We seek to win. We seek to... Uh, and prove ourselves better than they are. We have to prove ourselves better than they are. And then perfectionism. Those with a critical spirit are hard to please and they're never satisfied. And that makes a relationship with them often a miserable experience. Uh, very little life and hope flows from them. And then joyfulness. You can't be critical and filled with joy at the same time. It's helpful to look at problems, but with the mindset of finding hope and solutions, there's nothing more draining to joy than somebody who has to frequently find fault. And so, uh, the critical spirit is a curse. Um, my hope is that thinking through this as men, uh, it would cause us to think more about our own lives and our own attitudes in life because we can get so easily caught up in this. And I, I, I sat with a group of guys. Uh, it's Hardy's daycare is what it is. There. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since I retired, I meet up with those guys. And some of the guys are Christians and some of the guys are not. And there's some pretty rough conversations come up. But my desire in being with that group, besides the fact I grew up with a group like that in my family's uh, trucking business, um, it is to bring some light into that group. And to one guy a few weeks ago asked me for a Bible. So I gave him a Bible, and he's been telling me what he's been reading, and I've been trying to give him some direction. And another guy has had some health problems, and I've been praying with him and praying for him. There's Christian guys in this group as well. And, um, but there's some negative stuff. So I try, as well as come other Christian guys in the group, to bring balance to it all and let them see you know, there are some bright sides to this stuff. And the Lord is in control yes, when it looks like he's not. Amen. Um, and if we're critical, it, it robs us our, of our effectiveness as a follower of Jesus Christ, it robs us of the joy of our salvation. It robs our fellow followers of Christ of their joy. It weakens the body of Christ. But therein lies a much more of a, well, an eternal problem. A critical spirit emanating from someone who claims to follow Jesus Christ can rob the lost of the example that they may need to accept Christ. And I shudder to think what curse is attached to that. People are watching us. Sometimes the only witness that we give is the attitude that we reflect. Yeah. We may not be able to say the words. Matter of fact, I've heard some say the words, but their attitude reflected something else. Let me read this to you, and I'm going to bring this to a close. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. It's good stuff. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Boy, that's good advice. Yes. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Now, my opinion is, that kind of attitude could bring world peace. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the instruction that you give us, not only in your word, but by the illumination of it by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for these men. I thank you for their devotion to you. And I pray that whether it is BMIC or whether it is the churches each of these men represent or the families they represent, as we live our lives following you, that we will be light to the world, that we will be the salt of the earth. And in a world that seems so busy, critically tearing down and uh, destroying and uh, just so many negative things, remind us, Lord, that you still are on your throne and that Jesus Christ is still the answer and uh, that we will be disciples of Christ and ambassadors for Christ in a world that needs Christ. I pray this to your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.